Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. The basics of survival are usually broken up into three categories. There's food, there's water, and there's shelter. Sometimes people add a fourth category, they'll say security, but really security is just there to help you secure the first three. Now the first two of those are pretty academic. They're pretty straightforward and you see a lot of videos here on YouTube about them. That's food and that's water. Water, you make sure you have access to water and you have the ability to purify it. For food, you make sure that you set some food aside, have some plans for how to generate your own food, maybe with gardening, maybe a hybrid of those two things, but you know, all said, pretty straightforward. The one thing that you don't oftentimes see a lot of is the idea of shelter building. I think there's a couple reasons for that. One, it's pretty straightforward, you know, uh, how to secure food. It's like, you know, just go out and buy a bag of potatoes, buy a bag of rice, you know, set it in a cool, dry place. You know, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around that. The idea of building a shelter, it is more complicated. It's more time consuming. It can be more expensive. And I think a lot of people are a bit daunted by it. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about that one because it's really important. If you don't have a proper shelter, it can be really problematic. Even if you have access to good food and good water, if you're out in the elements and you're freezing and you're wet, that's a real problem. So we're gonna talk about that in this video, not only because I feel like it's oftentimes underrepresented in the preparedness community here on YouTube, but also because I have a fair degree of expertise in it. I have built four houses in the past, two mini houses, two full-size houses. I'm in one of them right now. So I've been through this before and I'm very happy and excited to share it with you. Now, in the past, I've also done a couple of programs about this topic. I've done one that's kind of a 40,000 foot view of like the whole thing, uh, you know, beginning to end, you know, from securing land to getting all your building permits, doing the actual building, like the whole, the whole thing condense into about a half an hour. I've also done an entire series about the day in and day out, every single day, literally, uh, you know, the irritating stuff, the, you know, exciting stuff, whatever, about the entire process, which is called Project Homestead Little House of Quarantine. So today, what I'd like to do is share with you one of those videos and give you links because, you know, to some degree, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. You know, I don't wanna go back to the drawing board. <laughs> Because I've uh, done these videos in the past, I wanted to share one of them with you here at the end of this introduction and then direct your attention to a real long uh, series that is about this whole topic. And the reason that it is really long is because it can be a really long process to build an entire house. Like I said, I've built two full-size houses, two mini houses. Now, building a full-size house takes an enormous amount of time and a, a reasonable amount of money, but building a mini house can be done in maybe about a month or so, and it can cost, you know, like somewhere three, four, five thousand dollars. I mean, the, the cost of a reasonably good used car or like a really, really nice uh, vacation. It's something that is accessible to people, and if you can get land that isn't necessarily, you know, considered quote unquote buildable, if a, a lot doesn't have road access or enough road frontage, it's not considered buildable, you can get pieces of land like that for a lot less money because they don't have that, that attribute of like, being buildable. Uh, so you can save a lot of money getting land that's kind of remote. And if you're willing to carry in the materials, you could make something really wonderful for yourself, something that is going to protect you and your family in a crisis. So I have uh, my video kind of about the process. It kind of leads you from, you know, permitting, like going through everything. So you can kind of have a sense of, you know, what's in store. And if you're still interested after the fact, I'd highly recommend you check out this series. Here's a link to it right now. It's called Project Homestead Little House of Quarantine. It's a series that I made while I built 
this house, the one that I'm in right now. Uh, as it, uh, at present, I'm at day 900 of that series. It's, you know, it's a really long series and it really covers all the nitty gritty nuts and bolts. The whole thing of building your own house, your own structure, it's not all peak moments. It's not all that last nail that goes in and you're done. There's lots of irritating parts of it. There's lots of frustrating parts of it. A lot of that has to do with regulations and all those sorts of things. And we go through that in the, uh, in the series, not to try to uh, dissuade you from doing, because I think it's wonderful. I've done it four times. I obviously must think that there's something good about it. Uh, but the reason that I uh, you know, really bring you in every little bit every single day is so you get a real sense of the scope of a project and a real sense of the types of stumbling blocks and hurdles that are waiting there for you. Because if you get a false sense of how easy something can be, once you step into it, you might think that like you're just the only person that's had, ever had all these problems, and that could be really frustrating if you feel like, I, you know, I, I'm just not doing it right. If you know that that's just kind of the way that it is, and that's the way it is for everyone, I think it can help encourage you to like, you know, other people have been through this before, they've gotten through it, I can do it too. So if after the, uh, the video that plays after this introduction, you're still interested, I would highly recommend check out this series. Like I said, it's long, it's dull, it's boring, but if you don't have the uh, enthusiasm to sit through a boring video series about building a house, you probably don't have the enthusiasm to build the house anyway. So if you really have this fire under your butt, you really want to do it and it, it'll bring a, a bunch of wonderful things to your life, especially in a crisis situation, if you want to get out of where you are and, and go to a re retreat location, how much more safe and secure will you feel just knowing you have that that place that you can go to. And you know that, you know, if things really go crazy, you always kind of have this fallback position. That's a great amount of security of insurance in your life. People pay all sorts of money for insurance, you know, paying money to someone else, paying money to some company. Uh, there's something really to be said for, you know, paying that into sweat equity of some, uh, not, not so much paying money for something, but paying time, paying effort for something that you can achieve for yourself. And when you achieve building a structure, building a, um, a shelter for yourself, it not only gives you all those kind of things that you're thinking of right now about like, oh, I'd have a place to go and you know, et cetera, et cetera. It also gives you a real sense of accomplishment. You know, after I built the first uh, structure for myself, my first home, uh, and by the way, you might say, well, it's easy for me to be advocating this. I'm a carpenter, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's easy for me, but you know, you, you don't have all these skills. I'm not a carpenter. I'm an artsy fartsy, you know, video guy. I do illustration. I, I, I'm an art guy, and uh, prior to building my first house, I'd never even had built a birdhouse. I just had enthusiasm, I had confidence in myself, and that's really all that you need. So, uh, going through the process, after I finished that first house, I really felt like I could do anything. It really gave me a, an enormous uh, sense of empowerment, knowing that there was this big project that nobody is supposed to be able to do. I mean, we're told by society, you know, that's something you pay someone else to do. That's something you buy. That's something that you save up hundreds of thousands of dollars for, you know, borrowing from banks, being in debt for the rest of your life. And because it's not accessible, you know, you and I can't do that for ourselves. Once you do that, once you crack that nut and you find out that's not true, you start wondering what are the other things that I'm being told I can't do that maybe I can. That's it. Thanks for watching. Here's the, uh, half hour series about this topic. And again, if you are still enthusiastic about it, I'd highly recommend check out Project Homestead Little House of Quarantine and you'll get a sense of what it is really day to day, to day, to day, to day, to day. <laughs>
I even going? Where am I going? Hey YouTube, this is Praxis Prepper. I think for a lot of people, the bug out bag is kind of the, the symbol of what it means to be prepared. I think for most preppers that's the case because most people, most preppers, live in a situation where if the shit ever hit the fan, if there ever like some kind of a collapse, grid down, or anything like that, they're in a position where they need to leave where they're at. So the bug out bag it, it, symbolically is their life support system. Well, symbolically and in actuality is their life support system to get them out into a place that is, is better for them. Uh, but there's another category of preppers, and I, I, I feel like I fall more into this, this category, of people who aren't looking necessarily to bug out, but to bug in. Those are the people that already are in a situation, in a location that uh, is a good place to be if there's ever a collapse. Um, and for those people, I, I don't think that the bug out bag has the same sort of symbolic cachet as it does for people who live in more of an urban environment or near an urban environment or in a suburban environment or anywhere around a city pretty much. There's a theme here. You, know, you want to you know, escape from the city. But I think for people who are already out in, a, in an environment they, they feel secure in, their home, their homestead, is, has that same kind of sim, uh, symbolic meaning that the bug out bag has for uh, you know, most of the others. Uh, for the longest time, I've wanted to do a video, which I'm doing right now, about uh, how to set up a homestead, how to set up a retreat location. It's something that I've done. This house here, when I got here, it was just forest, and I, I built this house here with my own two hands, you know, every nail, every board, you know, me and my dad did it together, or me and a friend, you know, it was just usually me and somebody else. Usually my dad helped, which was awesome of him. Thank you very much. Uh, this is something that I, I've done, and it was not, it was not unattainable at all. Now, prior to this, I'd never even built a birdhouse before. And uh, just through determination and motivation, I you know, got the skill set to, to build this. It took me about three or four months. I started on September 1st of one, of one year, and in the same year by Christmas, you know, the house was pretty much, much up. Uh, the whole thing all together cost somewhere between sixty uh, and eighty thousand dollars It was about 60000 for the land and the house kit and about you know another 20 maybe for the foundations and you know septic work you know wiring things of that nature maybe a little more than 20 but somewhere in that ballpark for so for somewhere between 80 and 90 thousand dollars i you know had a house that could sustain me and support me oh is that it just a hundred thousand dollars well let's let's open up the old wallet here and uh, see what we got going on we got a, a five we got a few ones Ooh, a 20 but huh, not a hundred thousand dollars what gives okay yeah hundred thousand dollars that's a lot of money uh and uh I think it's worth addressing that and acknowledging that. But uh, there are two factors here. Uh, one is that you, not everyone has to build a house like I built. I built a house that cost almost $100,000 because I could afford to build a house that cost almost $100,000. You don't have to do that. In fact, just a couple of years ago, right on my property, I built a smaller house that I, I just permitted it as a shed, but it's fully insulated. You could totally use it as a house. Uh, I built it for a tiny, tiny fraction of this whole thing. So let's check that out. And then I have another tip that I think is even more important than, than that. So let's, well, I've really underplayed what we're about to go to, but it's a really cool shed. So let's check it out. It's negative 15 degrees outside right now. And you can see it looks very chilly on the shed here that I built, but we're going to go inside and you're not going to be able to feel it because you're just watching this on a video, but I can feel it right now. It is much more comfortable in here. I mean, it's probably just a few degrees above freezing in here, but it's much, much more comfortable than being outside. And if I put a heater in here, in 10 minutes you have this place being really toasty. Now, this was not built as a, a house. Well, it was built as a house, but it was not permitted as a house. It just permitted as a shed, but it's super well insulated. It's got these nice, big, sunny windows that let in lots of light. There's some storage area up here, you know, going across these collar ties. On the other side, over here, I have some more storage area up up here but that's on two by fours and two by sixes that is a totally appropriate place to sleep you can throw a mattress up there be really really comfortable there's about 150 square feet down here just on the bottom alone not counting what's up there uh and this whole thing costs about you know four thousand dollars or so now uh you know you could 
get kind of a cheap used car for about four thousand dollars or you could build your own house so there's all different levels that you can do things if you don't have the capability of saving up ninety or hundred thousand dollars you know even over a series of years you can always do something like this put this up out on your land and you have something for your family to go to that can keep them safe now i don't have a wood stove or anything hooked up but you can have that stuff ready to go you can have a heater ready to go and uh, once you get to the point where you feel like you need to use the stuff you can hook the stuff up again uh, you know you can hook the stuff up later now I, of course that introduces all the issues with uh, you know are you going to kill yourself from carbon monoxide poisoning because you, you know, you're, you're hooking this stuff kind of jerry-rigged at the last minute? That's a whole other video. you got to be careful about that kind of stuff. But the point is, is that you can have a place that you can come to and it does not have to cost you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars or anything like that. $4,000, the cost of a reasonably cheap used car. You can have a home that can keep your family safe, warm, and secure if you ever need to use it. All right, so really nice, really cozy, much better than living in a tent in the middle of winter in, in, in a crisis situation and a tiny, tiny fraction of all of you know building a house like this. But like I said, there's another even more important way of thinking about being able to accomplish this as a financial goal. And that is that no matter how little you personally make, there's always somebody who is making less than you and probably living not too far from you. I, as I was saving up for this house, uh, I was earning about $30,000. My, my wife at the time was earning about $20,000. And together that's $50,000. But instead of living like people who make $50,000, uh, we chose to live like people who made $20,000. We lived off of $20,000. We were living in a campground, uh, you know, didn't go out to restaurants, all that kind of stuff. Whatever, whatever we had to do, we lived on $20,000 and saved that difference. We make 50, we spend 20, that leaves 30. Uh, that's a lot of money, $30,000. We were fortunate we were able to do that. We didn't have children at the time. But again, no matter how little you make, there's always somebody who makes less than you. And a lot of those people have kids too. So as long as you keep that in mind, earn here, spend here, you'll always be able to save up that amount. Now, for me, that was $30,000. That was great. Allowed, allowed me to get to this goal a lot faster. For you, maybe it's less than that, maybe it's more than that. But even if you can only save $1,000 per year or $2,000 per year, as long as you do that and you keep investing that towards your future and hold on to that money, eventually you're going to at least be able to build something like that nice sort of shed structure and have that in the, ca in the case of an emergency. Uh, so I think that's the most important part is even if you only make $20,000 a year, there's someone living nearby, I'm sure, that's living off of 19 or living off of $19,900. <laughs> Maybe it's just $100 a year. Whatever it is, there's always someone living on less than you. And the bigger you can stretch that margin, the faster you're going to be able to reach your goal. Okay, so let's go to the rest of the video about how to get there. For somewhere between eighty dollars and $90,000, I you know, had a house that could sustain me and support me. Um, and it is, uh, it's a great feeling to have that. And I've wanted to share that with people for a while uh, because I think it's really attainable to anyone. Uh, but I haven't done a video on it because there are so many pieces to it. Uh, it's, I mean, you could do a whole web channel just on the idea of, of building a homestead. So it was something that I just kind of kept delaying, delaying, delaying. But someone on Patreon, one of my executive producer level uh, contributors, asked me to do the uh, asked me to do this exact topic and which is a great topic and um as an executive producer on, on praxis prepper i am am at their service that I, you know they want the video i gotta do the video so i it was a good kick in the butt to me to do the video because i think it's really important it's really um valuable to a lot of people but it's so big uh and it takes a lot of time in doing it but it takes a lot of a lot of time thinking about it as well. So I'm going to try to hit some of the high points here, uh, some uh, kind of to get you going. I'm going to uh, refer you to a few really good books that I think would be helpful in the process. Uh, you know, fun, uh, they're fun reads, not like, you know, boring tech manuals or anything like that. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, if this is something that you think that you might like for yourself, hopefully I can get you motivated to do it. Because like I said, I did not have any skill set that 
made this a natural decision for me to make, uh, to just say, I'm gonna make my own house. Uh, I think the only thing that made me uh, feel like I could do it is just that with almost everything else in my life, I oftentimes feel like a caring, thoughtful, mildly intelligent, moderately intelligent lay person can do a better job on something than an expert who doesn't necessarily care that much about that particular person they're working for. I, I'm always feeling like I'm second guessing professionals and finding out later that it was appropriate to do so because you know, they don't put as much care, I think, a lot of times. You know, I'm, and not all professionals are like this. I know when I had my own cinematography business, I always tried to, you know, do my best work for people. So not everyone is like this, but uh, a lot of times when you're hiring out people, you know, you're, you're one person in a whole group of people they're working for. I, th I don't think anyone will ever care as much about your project as you will. So even if you don't have any training in it, I think that just the fact that you care more and as long as you have moderate intelligence, like myself, uh, it's something that's attainable to you. So, uh, so let's go. What are, what are the things you need to think about if you're going to relocate? First, what you need to think about is why are you relocating? Uh, you obviously want to get out of where you are. So you feel there's something not secure or not ideal about where you currently are. And you want to get someplace else. So you need to decide on a region level where you might want to go. Now, there are um, a, so many considerations to think about uh, when you're doing that. So I'm gonna recommend a book that I think is a really, really good book. It's called Strategic Relocation and is written by Joel Skusen. Now, Joel Skusen has a website and I'm not gonna say that I think everything that's written on his website came out of the mouth of little baby Jesus. Uh, I, you know, there are some definite like worldview differences between myself and Joel Skusen, so don't go to his website and say, why did you send me to Joel Skusen's website? You know, he, he makes some valid points here and there, but but, you know, there's some other things that you know, I would not necessarily make videos about myself. Uh, but he deserves really good high marks for this particular book that he put together. He did, there's a lot of research in it. Again, strategic relocation. Uh, and it talks about uh, how to go about assessing different risks that uh, you might be faced with if you're trying to find a, a retreat location. Uh, and he uh, goes into, you know, proximity to a city, obviously in a city and a major collapse, people are gonna be streaming out of the city, there'll be rule of law issues and things like that. Uh, also just major thoroughfares out of uh, major metropolitan areas. Uh, people are gonna be trying to make an exit, exodus from the city. At some point they're gonna run out of fuel, then they're gonna fan out from there. Uh, you know, from that to floods, to earthquakes, uh, to the idea that if the grid ever went down uh, for a long period of time, nuclear power stations are gonna lose their ability to to cool their fuel rods and nuclear power stations are all gonna start melting down if there was ever a widespread, long-term major collapse event. Um, so he has a wonderful book that's about all of these things. It's an it's a enjoyable read and uh, has a great section of maps on uh, the United States state by state. Uh, it has all the individual states in there. I, I believe it has some of the territories as well. And, uh, and I, how many provinces are in Canada? Is it five? I don't know, I'm sorry. I don't even know how many territories are in the United States. I, it, it's about five though, isn't it? Maybe it's like, it's, it's way more, isn't it? It's like 20 or something, I don't know. Anyway, he has maps of the various provinces in Canada and all, all the uh, continental United States states. I think he did Hawaii and Alaska in there also. I should really do more research about this stuff. But anyway, Strategic Relocation, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And it will give you a sense of if you don't feel like you're in a safe, secure place where you are right now, it'll give you a sense of some places that might be better for you and give you some considerations about, uh, uh, you know, just things you want to you want to factor in. Once you figure out a region that you would like to do, uh, you're going to have to figure out uh, a specific kind of area within that region. And the kind of things that you're going to be looking for are ge geographic, uh, basically. You're going to want to uh, make sure that you're not in a flood zone. Uh, that you're not in like a, a rock fall, uh, slide zone. Uh, there's going to be, you know, little micro security issues in, in any given uh, location. As you're thinking specifically about flooding, you're going to want to keep in mind that a lot of FEMA's flood maps, you know, there's places that are getting 100 to 200 year floods every decade or so. So I think a lot of that data is outdated. Uh, and, you know, with our changing sort of climatological situation, and I know that that's just a Toyota hoax, that there isn't really any actual climate change, you know, from bizarre weather patterns to uh, droughts and famines and, and melting ice caps, uh, Toyota has something up their sleeve and they are, they are nefariously creating 
the feeling as though we, I'm sorry, I'm being so sarcastic about that. I just think it's silly. Uh, but clearly uh, there are changing weather patterns. There are changing, uh, you know, uh, flood threats and things of that nature. So uh, whatever data you're looking at from FEMA in terms of flood maps, obviously you might want to keep in mind that a lot of those almost never happening floods are happening more frequently now. Um, once you, you decide on you know, an area that you don't feel like you're going to get flooded away or you know, buried in a rock slide or anything like that, you're going to want to look for a specific area. And what I would suggest and what most people suggest is trying to find some place that has a little bit of a slope to it. See, with the new Patreon support, we've got the budget for brown cardboard, uh, not, not cardboard, I can't quite afford cardboard at this moment, but brown construction paper. We have the budget, so, so we, we're bringing in, the, bringing in the big props here. You want something that has a little bit of a slope to it. I got a little Lego building here. Again, woohoo, crazy budget. You're going to want to situate yourself on kind of a slope that's facing in a southerly direction. And this is actually south. There's a big bank of windows in front of me. That's why I positioned myself here so I could be illuminated by the windows. And you want that sunlight to be coming in to your windows on your, uh, on your house uh, here. So you want to find sort of a south facing hillside and you're going to want to open up the hillside to this, uh, you know, on the south facing uh, side of it so that the sun will be coming in hitting your, your windows, hitting the hillside, warming up. You want to create kind of a little micro bubble of a you know, nice, warm kind of climate. If you're going to be uh, you know, there through the winters, it's going to save you on heating fuel and everything. You want, also want, want to have a lot of forest remaining around your house to keep the winds from the north and the east and the west kind of blowing over you. And it's going to create this nice little bubble for you right there with the sun coming in. Now, the sun orientation in terms of warming the inside of your house is not that as critical as it used to be because in a lot of municipalities you have to uh, use what's called low E glass in your windows and that is a, gla a glazing that prevents uh, heat from radiating in or out through your windows and it's good keeping the heat from radiating out through your windows because you know you pay to heat your house and then you want to keep that heat uh, but it's not so great because it also keeps sunlight from coming in through your windows and warming your house and I'm someone that does a lot of solar cooking and I know that even a small window lets in an enormous amount of heat. You can cook lasagna in an oven that has an opening about the size of your normal, you know, window. So, uh, so there's a huge loss there if you have to install low E glass wherever you build. Um, you're, you're not losing the heat that you're creating inside your house, but you're, you're not going to be picking up a lot of that, that sunlight from sun, uh, southern exposure. But I still think it's a good idea to aim yourself to the south because you will pick up a little bit of sunlight. Uh, and who knows, you know, even if you have to install low E glass on those windows, if they ever break, you know, the building inspector doesn't know what you replace it with. I'm not advocating anyone break the law, but you know, who knows what happens in the dark of night. And just in general, it's sunnier and cheerier to have you know, more sunlight coming in if you're into being sunny and cheery like I am. Uh, when you're looking for a hill slope, I should mention you don't want something like this. Yeah, you know, being down in the bottom of a valley, even if it's pointing in the right direction, this is gonna act as a funnel conduit for runoff and everything and you don't want to be having water running off at your house. Ideally you want a little bit of a bulge. I'm, I'm going to exaggerate the bulge but a little bit of a bulge up and that'll keep the water sort of shedding away from from your home in that direction. Uh, but that's the general idea. You'd want to put your gardens and solar panels down here. You can put solar panels on the roof. I'm not a huge fan of that because if you get snow you know they, they oftentimes do get covered for quite a while if you're getting uh, you know, snow on your roof. So I think it makes a lot more sense to have the solar panels down low so you can clean them off if, you, if you're relying upon that electricity. But this is the general idea. You wanna find a south facing hillside with kind of a, a concave, convex, bowing out, concave, convex. Gosh, I'm, I'm gonna put right here which one you want because I forget which one's which. Uh, but that bending kind of out, you don't want to be in the bottom of a valley and uh, you know, facing in a generally southern, southerly direction is going to be fine. Now, you, do, you don't have to get specific that it has to be exactly due south. Again, it's just you want to get some sunlight in there. You want to have it coming in. You know, if it's you know, 10, 15, even 20 degrees off, off axis, it's not going to ruin anybody's day. Uh, and then you want to decide on your, your building style. Now, I would definitely recommend putting in a basement, and I even sort of alluded to it here, a basement bermed in 
and maybe walking out on one side so you can get sunlight into the basement on that side. But having the earth wrap around you on the other three sides is really, really helpful uh, because it acts as a warming shroud in the winter and a cooling shroud in the summer. After you get about four or five feet down underground, uh, the earth is a pretty static 50 degrees. In the wintertime, that heat is gonna be constantly coming up into your house and it's going to be keeping your pipes from freezing. Uh, because you know they have to get down to 32 to freeze and 50 degrees is significantly above 32. I can walk away from my house in the middle of winter when it's zero or 10 degrees out and none of the pipes are gonna freeze. I don't have any heating going or anything. Just that constant geothermal oozing of heat out of the earth is, uh, is gonna keep the house from freezing. And that's a nice feeling to have. Uh, conversely, in the summertime, it's constantly air conditioning my basement. So if I don't want I don't have an air conditioner in the house. I don't have like a, you know, electric air conditioner or anything like that. So if I'm hot in the summer, I can just go down to my basement. And again, it's a walkout basement with plenty of sunniness, uh, you know, coming in. So you don't feel like you're in a dank basement. I can go down there and I can cool off and it's always really comfortable in there. And when I, then I can circulate that, that uh, cool air throughout the house, uh, you know, just with a simple fan. And uh, it's really wonderful. So if you can burn your basement down into the, the hillside, it's the best decision I accidentally made. I didn't realize when I was building this house, it, this house is about three quarters bermed in uh, on the basement. I didn't realize how wonderful of a decision that was gonna turn out to be, but it really has been one of the best decisions I accidentally made when I was building the house for so many reasons. Beyond that, you wanna decide on your, your building style. This is a post and beam house. I like post and beam styles. I like the way they look. I feel they're easy to put up. I was able to build this house from a kit with my, uh, my dad and friends help, mostly my dad, uh, help putting this up. It was generally just two of us doing the whole thing. It was very manageable. It's uh, 1,200 square feet, 600 square feet first floor, 600 square foot basement, uh, which is you know, nice and livable. So 1,200 square feet. And uh, it was really easy to put up. This worked for me. That doesn't mean it's the best building method for anyone of all time ever. Uh, this uses three inches of urethane foam on the walls, four inches on the roof, and uh, that allows me to heat the entire house all winter with about a cord and a half of wood, which if you buy wood is you know maybe two, three hundred bucks or something like that. And I, I usually try to cut down a lot of my own wood, so it's not even that. So for two or three hundred bucks, the whole heat house heats all winter and it gets its free cooling in the summer from the basement. So that's not a bad utility bill, two or three hundred bucks per year to keep the, the house uh, nice and you know comfortable for you. Uh, there are plenty of other building methods. There's strawn bale, there's cob, there's conventional construction. I just chose this one because it worked for me. I felt it was easy to put up and it's proved out over time that having you know, the insulation on the walls, uh, you know, keeps it warm, keeps it cool. It's just it's worked out really well for me. I should also mention that I did a lot of work insulating the basement. A lot of times people insulate their basement walls on the inside of the wall, but that's missing a huge opportunity to take advantage of all the thermal mass of that giant slab of concrete that you have there. If you can insulate on the outer wall, uh, the, the heat that you have created in your house is gonna absorb into your basement walls and be kept there. Uh, I have two inches of um, you know, that pink foam insulation buried all around the whole, uh, exterior uh, ba uh, basement wall and those walls absorb the warmth when I have a fire and then slowly radiate it back out into the living space. So I think that's a, a really great way of helping to stabilize the temperature. There is so much that you can go into in terms of building styles that I, I did, does not fit in one video, but what I wanted to do is share one book which I think is great and it was sort of my go-to as I was preparing for my house. It's called Living Homes and it's written by Thomas Elpel. If you recognize the name Thomas Elpel, it's because he wrote another great book about ed uh, edible wild plants that I've recommended on, on other episodes. Uh, he's a great writer, he uh, does primitive living and everything, and he's built his own home. I actually had a chance to visit it once. This is his entry greenhouse, and it keeps super warm even in the middle of a Montana winter, just with the sun pretty much coming through these um, uh, big non low E glass windows that he has on there. Living Homes uh, just goes through insulation and uh, uh, insulation systems. Uh, he does a lot of stuff about uh, uh, different types of concrete blocks with uh, insulation, all sorts of considerations about angles of sunlight and overhangs, different types of windows you might consider, air exchangers, 
Uh, he loves uh, building with stone and uh, cement and logs. That's not really my style, but there's a lot of in here on that. He goes into you know, recycling your water. This is a biogas plant for his, his chicken house. All sorts of information here. This is just a really great book to kind of get you going on a cold winter's day when you want to start planning for where you want to go next. Living Homes by Thomas Elpo. Um, beyond that, I think the only thing you need to think about is just to make sure that you've saved up enough money. I, I did not go into debt building this house. I lived in a trailer for like three or four or five years or something like that. Uh, so I could just save up the money. I think it's important to not be in debt because then you are able to just, you know how much money you have. You can take the time off of your work. You can build your house and everything. And uh, it's important to make sure you save up enough money. Like I said, this all in, this was like 80 or $90,000 for me. And it took me, you know, I guess five years to save that up. Um, I've always been like a big saver. And, um, and then once I started the project, I knew I had the funds and I didn't have to haggle with banks and have the banks, you know, picking apart my designs about what I was going to use for my insulation and everything like that. It just makes the whole process a lot easier. And beyond that, you just have to decide to do it. As I said at the beginning of the video, I had no previous experience doing any of this when I was uh, starting off. I learned a lot doing this. Now I feel fairly confident in, it, uh, in my ability to build things. And that's a really great feeling to have, uh, to be able to just feel that you can create your own structures to keep yourself warm and safe from you know, the elements. And uh, on a psychological level, I think that there's almost as much to be gained building your own house and realizing a lot of those things about yourself than there is on the practical level of actually getting the house up and everything. So, if you're interested in the journey, I'd, rec I'd recommend checking out those books. Um, but don't be discouraged. There's going to be there's going to be hassles right now. I'm uh, moving to a new place a couple hours from here. Uh, it's a better situation, and there's a lot of lessons I learned building this house that I'm going to be, you know, passing on to that uh, that uh, the new place that I'm building. Uh, but already there's hassles. Um, the, the excavation crews down there, and there was a whole thing over the past week where they couldn't do any work because there was a nail missing from a tree. There's supposed to be a nail on a tree somewhere. It was a, uh, called a benchmark that sets a, a reference elevation for all the work to be done. And people couldn't find this nail on a tree. So work kind of ground to a halt over a missing nail, literally, um, and it, which is silly. <laughs> uh, and there's all sorts of things like that. So I, you, you need to understand there's gonna be irritating things like that that are gonna come up. There are gonna be regulations that you wish you didn't have to deal with uh, that you think are just absurd. And sometimes you just have to take the punch to the stomach and accept it. And then you know you deal with it later after you're in and you have your occupancy permit and you, you can kind of make things the way you want. Again, I'm not advocating anyone break any laws at all whatsoever. We should all follow building codes to the, to the letter and not deviate from them one inch. But sometimes when you do deviate from them more than one inch, there are a lot of benefits to be had uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency, in terms of sustainability, in terms of reliability, uh, and in terms of security in general. So uh, those are all decisions you have to make on your own. But if this is something you're interested in, look more into it, get excited about it. It's something you can do and it's also one of the best financial decisions you can ever make to build your own place. Because like I said, I put $90,000 into this house, 80 or $90,000. I put about three or four months of my life into the house building it. And the moment that it was finished, it was assessed at like $200,000 or something like that. So within three months, I doubled my money. And I don't know of many jobs that you could work where you can make a hundred or $110,000 in three or four months. I'm sure there's plenty of people that have those jobs, but I've never had one of them. So if you're excited about it, it's a good financial decision. It's a good decision for your family, safety, and security. Think about it, check out the books, get excited about it, and do it. That's it. Thanks for watching. Okay, so you still up for this? Well, if you are, I want to show you one more thing. It's behind the most recent homestead that I built. It's uh, the newest tiny home that I built. And the tiny home is a shed. I'm using it as a shed right now, but it's a perfectly acceptable place where you could live. It has a basement, it has an attic where you can sleep. It's insulated, it stays uh, above freezing all winter, and that's even without any kind of heating source in it. So let's go and we'll check that out. On the way though, I wanna show you one other thing that's kind of a nice little uh, 
an asset that we have here at the, uh, the homestead we're working on right now. Uh, this is a root cellar. Now, I'm not going to say I want to live underground, but this is a root cellar, which could also be used as a fallout shelter. I built it here, you know, mostly, hopefully, <laughs> as use, uh, for use as a root cellar, and it's been a really great asset since we built it. But there's all sorts of uh, different designs that you can, uh, you know, come up with for creating some kind of a, you know, a retreat location. It doesn't just have to be a wooden structure built above ground. There's so many different options. That's why I mentioned this one. And in particular, here are the, uh, the windows for it. These are light tubes that go down into the inside. They're pretty small, so they only... Uh, you only drop a little bit of light in there, but they make it so if you didn't have power in there, you at least wouldn't be plunged into pitch black. Well, let's go into this structure right here. This is the shed that I was talking about. It is 14 feet long by uh, 10 feet wide, 140 square feet. One of the nice things about that, at least in this town, is you don't even need a building permit in this town. Different towns are different, but you don't even need a building permit to build something like this. Let's pop inside and I'll show you just a little bit of what's going on on the inside here while I clumsily get the camera off the tripod. There we go. The first thing that you'll notice here is the shed and the main house are built in the same way using the same materials. Same wall boards, same types of windows, same types of doors and everything. The only difference is scale. Uh, they even uh, both share a basement. Uh, this is a concrete basement. Uh, this one's only four foot high walls, whereas the other one has, I think, nine foot high walls. But uh, they're both insulated. This one has foam on it, and there's some wire lath. The wire lath is there waiting to get some stucco work on it. We just haven't finished it because it's fairly low priority. But it's exactly the same as the house in terms of general building materials. The only difference is just scale. And this one is 140 square feet, so like I said, I didn't even need to get a building permit to build it in this town. Again, to repeat, not all towns are the same. All right, so here we're inside, it's a little dark, but we ran lights in here. We've got a light on either side of the wall, and as you can see, we are using this for storage right now. But with 140 square feet, if the storage was not here, you'd have an awful lot of uh, room to move around in here. This is the kind of the main area here, and you can see the posts and the trusses, similar to the other house structures that you've seen in this, uh, in this video. Uh, and we even have a basement. And here's our basement. There's a hatch that goes down to the basement. We're going to go down there in a little bit. That's a great storage space down there. But before we go down there, I would just illustrate here is our attic area. There's the entrance to the attic. Uh, the attic is probably, well, it's not 140 square feet because it's, it's a little bit more narrow. You can see it only runs from there to there. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's 100 square feet up there. But plenty of room to put a bed up there. We've got a whole area over here where you could put a bed and even maybe some more storage area back over on on this side of it a lot of room in here and this kind of structure like i said could be built uh, much more easily obviously than building a large full-scale house so you could sleep up top you know do your living uh, uh, activities uh, down on this level and then storage in the basement let's pop into the basement there are lights down there so let's go down Turn on the lights, and here we are down in the basement area. Like I said, these are four foot walls, not full uh, full height walls, so you have to kind of crouch around down here. But as you can see, there's plenty of storage space. Now, in an emergency situation, I think you'd want to use the storage space maybe more for food as opposed to sleds and spare lighting fixtures and things of that nature. But uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of space down here. Uh, the floor of this area is just gravel. We didn't bother to do it, you know, anything special beyond that. Uh, when the walls were uh, poured for the for the foundation, what we did is uh, I just laid down some plastic across all of what was left is dirt uh, between the footing and uh, then just poured this, this gravel on top of it. And it's a perfectly acceptable uh, surface. The, the plastic acts as a vapor barrier, keeping the place from getting overly moist, although having a dehumidifier also helps with that. And um, it, it's a really nice place for storage. Again, 140 square feet. There's a lot of space there. Just got a couple of these lamps attached to the, the floor joists there. Let's turn those guys off, and then we'll, we'll pop back up into this 
area up here. So you can imagine if you were in a situation where you needed to get out of wherever you are, and if you had a structure like this, it could be very, very comfortable. Again, this structure uh, does not go below freezing in the wintertime. We have two inches of urethane foam on the walls, and it's it's a great asset for us because I can store things like paint and things in here that I don't, I don't have to worry that they're going to freeze, uh, but even more so for your family. If you had a family and you don't want your family to freeze, uh, it becomes a really excellent asset that uh, can help to sustain you and sustain your family and sustain your your life. So if you still have enthusiasm about maybe doing something like this for yourself, great. I think that's wonderful. I obviously think this is something that is a great asset for my life. I've, uh, you know, this is the fourth structure that I've built and it really gives me that sense that I've talked about through this whole video of empowerment and on top of that it gives me a great sense of having a place to stay if there was ever some kind of an emergency event so if you have that enthusiasm check out that playlist that series that I mentioned where I uh, talk about building this entire structure right here we, we go through every day building this we also go through every day of building this if you're interested in just building a small house I, I'm you could look in the thumbnails and find out exactly which day uh, that you know the shed structure starts on. Um, it's in the spring. It's a springtime start. We like uh, when we began. We like poured the foundation of this, and then I remember I was shoveling snow off the top of it, and it was like one of our first early spring projects. We began with it. But if you want to get going with this, check out that that video playlist, and you'll get a real sense of what it takes every day, day in and day out. Also, for the rest of the series, for the 30 days of preparedness, uh, next up tomorrow is Iridium 242, uh, and they have a video that's about car preparedness. So if you're traveling and you want to have uh, emergency materials in your car, if an emergency comes up, like you're, you're driving, you're listening to the radio, and suddenly the shit hits the fan, what are the things that you might want to have in your vehicle ready to go? And that's what tomorrow's video is about. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.